I know it's hard when you begin the race. And at times you may feel depressed and down and out. You may feel like no hope is there for you, that you are lost. But it is in you to overcome the difficulties, to find the power within. It may feel like a war is around you, but you must surround yourself with others that will pick you up when you are down. To feel that teamwork build within you. You may feel devastated, but with your team around you, you can overcome your struggles. You can find your horizon as you go towards your goals. You have made the first step and your disabilities are now your strengths. Push past them, find the leader within you. Look within you to find the race. Push past the pain, discover who you are today. The journey may be hard, but you will discover the victor in you, the dream in you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ronald Palmer. I'm a motivational speaker, life coach, and counselor. Welcome to Real Talk. Why do I call it Real Talk? Because we're going to talk about things that on a daily basis you probably avoid talking about. I'm going to issue you a 30-day challenge, and I'm going to guarantee you that if you follow some of these techniques that I'm going to give you, that your life is going to change after these 30 days. I've used this with my counseling and life coaching clients, and I've given it in seminars. And when I get my feedback back, I realize that people tell me that they can and do better with some of these techniques. The three areas that we're going to talk about is one, finding out with your passion and your purposes in your life. Number two, looking at the role of responsibility. And lastly, unlocking your power within your life. When I became a motivational speaker, I was kind of full of myself. I thought that I could change the world. And I called an organization, what I'm not going to name the organization right now, and I said, you know, I really want to talk to one of your returning members, service members that have been injured. You see, my background is that I'm an Army combat medic. I'm a licensed professional counselor intern. intern. I'm a licensed chemical dependency counselor intern. And I spent the majority of my life in the military as a combat medic. I've been war tested. I really thought that my audience was going to be combat veterans. And so I made an appointment to go talk to one of these returning veterans. Well, I was on the phone and I said, you know, I really want to talk to somebody that needs my help. And I was ready to motivate him. She said, I have the perfect person for you to talk to. He came back from Iraq and both of his legs were blown off. Well, I held up my chest high and I was ready to go talk to this gentleman. She said, when you come, I looked at your website. I know you usually wear a blazer or a suit when you go out and talk, but when you talk to this gentleman, he's going to be on the, on the field. So come in your workout clothes. So I said, okay, I guess I'll come in my workout clothes. I made my way to the track. And as I approached this young man from behind, he was bent over. And he looked like he was crying. His shoulders were shaking. And so then the counselor and the coach and the sergeant in me kind of got ready. I said, I'm ready for this. And I walked up to him about to give him my knowledge and I realized that he was not crying. Rather, he was taking off his walking legs and he was putting on his running legs. And so now my whole mindset is changing. I said, so now what do I do? This man is about to go running. Do I run behind him? Do I run alongside him? Do I wait for him to return? And as I was in the midst of my conversation in my head, how many of you have done that, been in the midst, in your conversation in your head when something else happened? Well, I was in my head, and he took off running. I'm in pretty good shape, and I will tell you without any heartache that he whipped my behind. As I was running and trying to keep up with him on the track, one mile turned to two miles, two miles turned to three miles, and I finally told him, I said, man, we're going to have to quit for a minute. And I took a minute. And I laid on the grass. And it's ironic that this man with no legs stood down to look over me and looked at me and said, are you okay? And I was like, no. He gave me a few minutes to catch my breath and gave me some water. And I was amazed. 
I came to motivate him and he ended up changing my life. And so I decided not to be a teacher or a motivator, but to be a student. I asked him, I said, what is it within you that makes you get out of here, get out here on this track and run every day? And he looked at me and he told me, he said, you know what, before I lost my legs, I was the average soldier. As a matter of fact, I was below average. I had a couple physical training tests, or PT tests, we call them in the Army, that he failed. And now he scores at the top of the list. And he said to me, he said, I lost my legs, but I found my purpose. Again, I want you to get that. He lost his legs, but he found his purpose. And I asked him, I said, you know, I'm starting off as a speaker, and I really want to give the message of, our, of us combat veterans and those of y'all that have, you know, did the ultimate sacrifice and have lost a piece of you for us. What message do you want to give to them? And he said to me, he said, first of all, don't use my name because it's not relevant. But he looked at me and there was pity in his eyes. And I'll be honest with you, when I came, I looked at him with pity in my eyes. And he looked at me and he had pity in his eyes. And he pitied those of us that have two legs and two arms. Because he said to me, he said, don't wait until you lose your legs. Don't wait until you get cancer. Don't wait until your mother dies. Don't wait until your parents get divorced. Don't wait until you flunk out of school in order to find your purpose. So the first thing I want to ask you out there is, do you know your purpose? Do you wake up in the morning excited, full of energy? I kind of look at it this way. When I was a teenager, about 13 to 14 years old, I remember getting on my little BMX bike and pedaling for like 12 miles to go see this little girl. And I don't even remember her name. But when I was 13 or 14 years old, this relationship meant the world to me. If she didn't talk to me, my world would fall apart. I was so excited to get on the bike. I pedaled all of these miles just to see this little girl. When was the last time you got that excited about something in your life? If you get up in the morning and you go to work with that type of passion, then you are in your purpose. If you are not, then you're not in your purpose. So the question you may ask is, how do I find my purpose? How do I find my passion in my life? The answer is simple. You have to learn how to dream again. I do speeches all over the country. And I love talking to children because they don't have filters like we do. You know when a child gets in trouble a lot when they're 9 and 10 years old is because they keep doing stuff we tell them not to do. Hey, come back home before the streetlight comes on. Hey, don't talk to your mother like that. Please stop making all of these noises when you're out in public. We tell them no and no and no and no and no, and so we condition them to be in the no mindset. And what I want to start to do for you is to transform and take you out of the no mindset and to take you into the yes mindset. Yes, I know that I can get that promotion. Yes, I know that I can lose that weight. Yes, I know that I can be a speaker. Yes, I know that I can go back to college. But what I find is when I go to the schools and I ask the kids, I say, write down a list of 20 things that you want out of your life. And these kids, within a few minutes, fill up the front of the page, the back of the page, and most times they ask for another sheet of paper. When I ask the same question to adults, the 20 items become 10, the 10 items become five, and the five items become one or two and they take 30 minutes to do it. Why? I want you to think right now. If I asked you right now, name 20 things that you want out of your life, and I don't care what they are. They can be a brand new house, a brand new car, a better relationship. Write down 20 things that you want out of your life. What happened internally? What was that internal conversation in your life? Or in your head, what was that? I can tell you right now what some of the things that came into your mind. Well, I would love a new car, but I don't make enough money. I would love to have a better relationship with my wife, but I work too much. If you write down anything, I'm going to give you some pointers. I'm going to give you some highlights, some red lights to write down. This is one of your red lights. Red light this. 
You have to change your butts in the yets. You have to change your butts in the yets. When you say, I want to go back to school, but I don't have enough money. Change the verbiage. I want to go back to school, but I don't have enough money yet. I want a new car, but I don't have enough cash in my account yet. The first thing is if you change the philosophy, change the language, and add the yet to the end, then it changes the direction of where you're going. Because if you say, I want it, but I can't get it, then the only direction you have is a dead end. That's the sign. But if you change it from but to yet, then the street sign turns from being a stop sign into a directional sign. Now I know that I have to go left or right because you do have choices in order to be successful. I have dealt with people at the end of their life as a combat medic. One of the roles as a medic in the military is that we see people when they are about to leave this world. And I will tell you, especially dealing with young men that are on the edge of their life when they're about to leave this world, never has anyone said to me, I wish I would have made more money. No one's ever said to me, I wish I would have spent more time in the office. Every time that I talk to someone that is about to leave this world, whether they're an 18-year-old kid that is in the wrong place in Iraq and gets blown up, or I'm volunteering at a nursing home, and they are 90 years old and about to leave, the answer is always the same. I wish I would have spent more time with my loved ones. I wish I would have taken that vacation that I never took. So the next thing that I want you to red light is you need to write out your bucket list, all the things that you want to do before you die. If in this moment you were to find out that you only had 30 days to live, what are the things that you would want to do? You may be amazed to realize that some of the things that you want to do are very simple. I would love to go on a camping trip with my son before he goes to college. I would love to spend a quality evening with my husband or my wife. Write down the things in your bucket list and transform that bucket list into a daily list. List out what it takes to get there. And even if they're unrealistic, that's okay. I want you to stop being realistic for once because it's that reality that's got you where you are today. You know, there's a story about a man who found out that he was an acquaintance of a millionaire. He met this guy and he found out through the grapevine that he was a millionaire. And he did what most of us did. This guy has a lot of money. I want a lot of money too. So he talked to him and said, you know what, I want to make a lot of money. And the millionaire looked at him with a little gleam in his eye. He said, are you sure? He said, yeah, I'm sure. He said, I want you to meet me at the beach tomorrow at 4 a.m. And the guy was like, okay, I guess I'll meet you at the beach. I want some money. So he shows up in a full suit at nine, in 90 degree weather at the beach. And the millionaire tells him, I said, I'll go, go ahead and go out into the water. And the guy's like, I got a suit on. He said, do you want to be a millionaire? He goes, yeah, all right. So he walks out step upon step upon step until the water is waist deep. He turns around, he looks at the millionaire, hoping that the millionaire is going to say, by the way, you got this. I just want to make sure that you were good. But no, he looks at him and he says, I want you to go further. So the guy turns back around, he walks out further into the water, until the water's up to his chest. He turns around again, he looks at the millionaire, and the millionaire looks at him, he goes, no, nah, go further. And so now he goes up, and he goes further, and the water's up to his neck, and he looks out, and the millionaire's no longer on the beach. He's on a raft coming up to him, and he says, go out further. And as he works, walks further and further, the water is now up to his nose as he gets closer and closer, having a hard time breathing. And then he finds that he walks off a little cliff in the water and he sinks down. And as he tries to get up, the millionaire holds him down. And he's fighting for his life and he's fighting for his breath. He's about to pass out. And as soon as he's about to lose it, the millionaire lets him out and plops him down on the raft. He looks. And the millionaire looks at him. He said, what do you want? He says, I, I, I want to breathe. He said, you know what? If you want to be a millionaire, if you want to be successful, you got to want it like you want that breath right now. 
your feelings is the next thing that got to go. I want you to think of your kids if you're a parent. If your kid does not feel like cleaning the room, do we really care that the kid doesn't feel like cleaning the room? Absolutely not. I want you to think of life like your parent. And if you want to clean your room and you don't feel like doing it, who cares? Because we know, for example, if we have a child and we teach them how to clean their room, what we're teaching them is a lot more than cleaning their room. We're teaching them how to be organized. We're teaching them how to follow orders. We're teaching them all those things that they need in order to be successful in school. Life is teaching you the same thing. Some of you are not going to want to do some of the things that I'm talking to you about today because you don't feel like it. You're not going to feel like being embarrassed. You're not going to feel like stepping out of the crowd. You're not going to feel like doing these things. But what I want to tell you, just like a parent would tell you, who cares what you feel like? You have to be uncomfortable sometimes in order to find what true success is in your life. Step one, passion. Red light for you. Passion. What are you passionate about? Sometimes you're going to find out that the things that you are passionate about are found in the things that you hate the most. I'm going to give you an example. I'm in the military. And I had a sergeant major, which in the Army is the highest rank you can go in the enlisted realm. And he came to me right before he retired. And he said, Sergeant Palmer, I don't know what I want to do with my life, man, but I got to do something. I've done 26 years in the military, and I just don't know what to do next. Are any of you in that same situation? You're at a point in your life where you don't know what the next thing is? Well, we talked a few, and we had a few consulting and life coaching sessions, and he told me about something. He came from a neighborhood in California that were full of gangs, and he said that he had an option when he was a teenager that the judge told him that he had two options. Either you can go in the military or you can go to jail. Well, that was a, you know, that was a very easy choice for him. He said, I'm going to join the Army then. He went in the Army, and so many times did he almost get kicked out for drinking, for drinking and driving, for being insubordinate, for yelling back at people, for getting into fights, which is kind of ironic to me because this man now, 26 years later, is one of my mentors. He is the standard in which I measured myself as a soldier. His military bearing, the way he carries himself, the respect that he demands. And so to understand that this young man at the time came from such humble beginnings. And he talked about the kids and teenagers in his neighborhood. Because when he goes back home to visit his mother and his relatives, he realized that a lot of his friends were either dead, in prison, or on their way to one or the other. And when he talked about it, he'd get upset. He said, you know, old man, I can't stand these kids always in trouble. Nothing for their lives, and the veins would pop out in his neck. And this was a, a big man, so I had to step back a little bit. But in that moment, and in his eyes, I saw the passion. And I asked him a simple question. I said, let me ask you a question. As we looked on the computer of the statistics in his neighborhood, we realized that only about 20% of the people in the high school that he went to were going to graduate. And out of that 20%, only 5% of them were going to go off to college. And that was unacceptable. I said, close your eyes for a moment. I want you to imagine a foundation. And I'm going to call him Sergeant Major Smith. I said, imagine the Smith Foundation. And in the Smith Foundation, we took these kids off the street. We educated them. And we flipped the script. Where now, instead of 80 to 90% of those kids going to prison or jail or flunking out, that 90% of those kids were now going to college. And before I could even say the next thing, with his eyes closed, the biggest smile came to his face. I said, open your eyes. And he looked at me and said, you know what? Now I know what I want to do with my life. Do you know that man now is responsible for getting hundreds of kids off the street? Think about it for a moment. What is the one thing that gets in your nerves? What is your pet peeves? Is it people cutting in line? Is it customer service or bad customer service? Is it people that don't take care of children? Sometimes the thing that upsets you the most 
is the key to what you should do for the rest of your life. If you do not like it when people abuse children, then maybe you need to be an advocate. Maybe you need to join the Child Advocates of San Antonio. Maybe you need to become a CASA. If you realize that you don't like it when people disobey the law, then maybe you need to be a police officer. And again, I don't care about the reasons why you can't. People tell me I can't become a police officer. I can't become a counselor because I don't have enough money. I can't join the army or do any of those things because I'm overweight. Here's the reality. You are not going to be ready for something in the beginning. The reason why you go to college is so that you're different at the end. It is time to make that journey. I want you to think about what targets, what things you're aiming at right now. When you got up this morning, what were your goals? It is, you know, most of Americans are okay with the status quo. Do you know that less than 10% of Americans have any detailed written down goals for their lives? Do you get that? Less than 10% of the people in their daily lives know what they're going to do. You know, I was on LinkedIn and I got a text or an email from a gentleman who's a multimillionaire. I'm not going to say his name here. And he hit me up. And this is when I was really starting to speak. And he said to me, he said, you know, I want you to go ahead and give me a call. And he gave me his number. Well, on LinkedIn, it's great because it's like your resume. And I was able to look up this man. He's a multimillionaire. And maybe if he texts me during the next segment, I'll tell you who he is. But he, he texted me and we had a conversation. I called him up. And this man lives down the street for multimillionaires. And he said to me, one of your problems is that you're not charging enough money for your speaking opportunities. And at the time, I was honestly you know, charging about $50 or $100 at the most. And I couldn't get any more gigs. I couldn't figure out why. I realized that I was as good or not better than some of the other speakers, but I couldn't get any more speaking gigs. And he told me, he said, what you need to do, you need to charge $5,000 for your next gig. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not charging $5,000. I didn't tell him that because I don't know whether you know this or not, but people that are successful that are in that range speak differently than the rest of us. Here's a red flag for you. Here's a red light for you. I want you to highlight this. You need to surround yourself with people that are doing better than you. You need to surround yourself with people that are doing better than you. If you're making 50000 a year, find somebody that's making 100000 If your family is not doing well, surround yourself with other people that have great family lives. Surround yourself with people that are doing better than you. Because in human nature, that's not what we do. What we do in human nature, honestly, is that we find people that are doing worse than we are doing to make ourselves feel better. Well, I had a speaking opportunity. At the time, I wasn't really hurting for money. And so I decided I was going to ask for more, for more money. I couldn't bring it to myself to ask for $5,000. So I said, you know what? Um, and I was kind of timid, honestly, on the phone. I said, um, you know, hey, um, OK, I'm ready to do this gig. Um, well, for this opportunity, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll take 3000 And the gentleman on the other end of the phone, he said, OK. And it blew me away that he said, OK. Well, I found out later that they had paid all of their other guests between five to $7,000. And if I had asked for $5,000, I would have got it. What does that tell you? You get what you ask for. You get what you ask for. What I want you to do next, here's a red flag, a red light for you. Find a mentor. Find a mentor. And when you find a mentor, your mentor needs to be doing what you want to do. It is not enough to find somebody that's making the money you want to make because money is not success. So let's talk about that for a minute. What is the definition of success? So many of us in our society believe that success is making a lot of money. If that was the case, then you wouldn't have movie stars and a lot of these people committing suicide. On my blog and on my posts, I got a lot of posts about Robin Williams and the fact that he was in depression and, 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 killed and committed suicide. I was a crisis counselor here in San Antonio, and my job was to go to the hospitals, 
to the jails and to people's homes when they were either, when they were either homicidal or suicidal. That means that I was an expert in seeing people at their worst. Here's the reality. Many of you right now who clicked on this link, who opened up your phone, who opened up your computer, who found this on YouTube, are hurting. You step out your door every day, but on the inside you're in pain, and on the outside you're smiling. This really hit me when I was in Germany. I was stationed in Stuttgart, Germany, is where my son was born. And when I was there, the impression I got, and a lot of us got, of the German people, that they were very mean, tough people. They didn't smile a lot. But I ended up getting a few German friends. And then when I talked to them, they told me that Americans are fake. I was like, what? Fake? Americans ain't fake. And he looked at me and said, OK, man, if you're in the subway or you're in a train and somebody said, what's up? How you doing? What do you say back? I say, I'm fine. And he looked at me in my eyes, very serious. He said, but are you really fine? And I looked at him. I said, no, I guess not. How many times throughout this week have people asked you how you were doing and you said fine? It is important that you surround yourself with people that you feel safe enough to talk to when you are depressed. I don't know all the situations or circumstances for, for Robin Williams, but I will tell you this. If he was in a place of safety that he could have told others, I'm not doing well, then maybe he would have still been with us. Any of you right now that are not doing well, you need to be brave enough to look out and say, I am not doing well. Because just like in his case, he looked very successful on the outside. It doesn't matter if you have a, if you have a thousand or a million dollars in the bank. It doesn't matter if you have a mansion. It doesn't matter if you are successful on the outside, if you do not have that same success on the inside. Some of you are successful right now. Some of you are on the way to be successful, but you're still going to be depressed. So my question to you is this, can you really be successful if you're not happy? And the answer is no. It means you have to redefine what success means for you. What is success? Success is having enough money to take care of all your bills and a little extra to take care of some fun stuff. Success is having loving relationships, having people that love you and you love them back. Success is leaving things for your children, but not just money. You know, Les Brown says that it's not what you leave for your children, but what you leave in your children that counts. You have to teach them that success is character. If you really want to be successful, then find somebody else and do for them. Back to being a mentor and finding one. First of all, you have to find somebody that is successful. Successful in their relationship. Successful financially. They are living the life you want to live doing the things you want to do. And you need to ask them those intimate questions. How's your love life? How's your sex life? How's your work life? Are you successful? If they can meet all those criteria, then they qualify to be a mentor for you. Find a mentor. And don't stop until you find one that wants to be one for you. You know, I'm a licensed professor, counselor, intern. And I wanted to have a mentor that was a counselor. So I called around in San Antonio, and this is a challenge I have for you. Red flag, red light. I want you to find a mentor, and this is how you find them. You want somebody that is successful, no matter what field you're in. And I've helped many, many people do this. I don't care, I don't care whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a fireman, whether you're a garbage man. No matter who you are, there are people within your field that are the top of that field. And the top of that field usually come together. Call around and find out who they are. I called around in San Antonio and I talked to different counselors. And as I talked, I asked a simple question. Who is the best counselor or therapist in San Antonio? Who is the best counselor and therapist in San Antonio? I kept asking the question and over and over again, the list narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed until I got to about five names. 
And then when I found those five names, then I picked up my phone and I said, hey, my name is Ron Palmer. I am a counselor and veteran. I would like you to be my mentor. The first person, I didn't even get past the secretary. She hung up on me. The second person, I actually got to talk to the therapist. And he said, well, I don't know. Let me think about it. The third person that I talked to said, can you come right now? I dropped everything that I was doing. I got in my car and I went to him. The next thing, when you find your mentor, stop what you're doing and go talk to him or her. After I sat down and talked with him, I realized that the things that I was doing in my life were not going to give me the results that I wanted. You have to be flexible enough to understand that you may be doing the wrong things. So let's talk about that for a second. If you fail, you are not a failure. If you fail, you are not a failure. It is so hard for me to get this message through to most people in society. Most of my counseling people that I talk to, most of the people that I do life coaching, even when I go talk to the businesses and I do consulting, the hardest thing that I have to overcome is to change the mindset for people to understand that if they fail at a task, it doesn't make them a failure. Look at it this way. I want you to think about failing like falling. And in order to fall, you have to be standing up. And in order to fall, you have to be moving in a certain direction. So that means in order for you to fall, that means you took the energy to get up. It also means that you had a direction you were going in and then you fell down. That is motivation. Now, what most of us do is we stay laying down on the ground and you can't fail or fall when you're laying down. If you fail or you're falling, that's a good thing. Because now you know, hey, you know what? I was walking this direction, there's something in the way, now I can go this way, or I can go that way. I want you to take a moment, pause this video, or when it's done, take a note. I want you to look up research on successful people. I want you to look up Napoleon Hill. Look up all of these documents, all of these books and research articles out there that are backed by research and validated. And it will come and give you the same outcome every time. The way they became successful, the way that Ford became successful, the way that a lot of these guys earned their first million dollars is they first tried something and it didn't work. And they tried something else and it didn't work. And they tried something else and it didn't work. What's happening every time you try something? It's experience. Think about a newborn child. I want you to think of this because I realize this. I have, you know, I have a, all these degrees under my belt and I'm about to finish my doctorate degree. But I will tell you that the people and the people in my life that have really changed me and told me some information and showed me things are children because they do things that we should be doing in our lives that are simple. A newborn baby does not know how to walk. At all. Remember, they're born and they're in the crib. As a, as a parent, the first time they can roll over is a big thing. The first time that they crawl is a big thing. But sometimes we forget that these kids, before they learn how to walk, they learn how to fall. So as a baby, the baby is looking around and they get up. And they start to walk and then tumble over. But the thing about a child, unlike adults, is they get right back up. They don't have pride. They don't feel ashamed that they fall. They look down and they look at the chair or the candy. Or for my son, you ever notice that kids always go for the one thing you don't want them to get? So my kid, my son, Isaiah, would always go for the power outlets. Every time he would try, I'd move him to the left, I'd move him to the right, and he would go towards the power outlet. And so he'd fall down, and he wouldn't concentrate on him falling down. He would concentrate on his goal. Now, as his dad, I didn't like the goal he had, but he looked at his goal. Red light, red flag, when you fall down, stop paying attention to your falling, your failing, and start looking at your goal. I ride motorcycles, and then one of the things they tell you when you're, in your, when you're a beginning guy on a motorcycle is that you got to be careful because where your head goes, the bike goes. Where your head goes, the bike goes. Why is that relevant? Because when you're on a curve, the majority of people on motorcycles that fall, they usually fall or slide off their bike on a curve. Why? 
because they hit a curve, a blind curve, and they see an object in the road, and what they do is the same thing we do in cars. So when we see an object in the road and we're driving our car, we look at the object and we go around it. It's so different on a motorcycle, because if you get on a motorcycle and you look at the object or the tree limb or the rock, your motorcycle is going to go where your head goes. So wherever you're looking at is what you're going to hit. So what they tell you is, don't look at the obstacles, look at where you want to go. Don't look at the debris, look at the road ahead of you. Don't look at the fact that you failed out of school. Don't look at the fact that you got a GED. Don't look at the fact that you're overweight. Don't look at the fact that you don't feel successful. Don't look at the fact that everybody tell you you can't. Look at the road ahead of you and go past those goals. You can do it. You can overcome. But stop looking at what you can't do. Stop looking at your failures and start looking at your successes today, right now, right this minute. I dare you. The 30-day challenge. Research has so, it's, it's really talked and shown us that if you can stick with something for 30 days, 30 days, without a break, it starts to become routine. We all have rituals in our life. Rituals are the things you do in private that show publicly. How many of you know somebody that's successful? How many of you know a doctor that's making a lot of money? Or if you don't know anybody personally, I want you to look at people on TV. I love when I talk to my teenagers that are smoking pot every day and they look at Snoop Dogg. And they're like, man, I want to smoke weed because Snoop Dogg is smoking weed. Now, what you didn't see about Snoop Dogg, for example, is that the man had been working his trade, his art, his rapping, his lyrics, since the time he was like 10 years old. He'd write lyrics. He wouldn't sleep. He would, he would just write it and write it. You know why? Because he was like that man who was with the man there who sunk under the water. He looked it, he lived it, he breathed it. And he did it over and over and over again. His rituals to get up, to write his stuff down, to get up and do the thing. The doctor, every day in school, he studied and he studied and he studied and he pushed himself and he pushed himself. So often in our society, we look at the jet that he may have, we look at the car that he may have, we look at the car that she may be in, and we don't understand it is the rituals that they were doing privately that got them to the things publicly. Okay, so, so far, I've been very inspiring and motivating to you, but now I'm going to hit you where it hurts. I want you right now to pick up your iPhones and your Androids. I want you to go where it says Netflix and delete that app. I want you, if you're in your car right now and you're at that fast food restaurant, McDonald's, wherever you're at, I want you to pull away. If you're sitting at the table and you have your headset in and you're looking at this on YouTube, I want you to cut that hamburger in half and put it down. What am I telling you? It starts today. You have rituals that are leading you places. The things that you are doing are the things that are making you who and what you are. I told you already about power, about passion, responsibility. Well, passion was the first thing. The second thing is responsibility. You know, it says that everybody is self-made, but only the successful people admit it. I used to work at Haven for Hope, which is a homeless shelter here in San Antonio. And when I would ask a lot of the homeless population why they were homeless, they would tell me they were homeless because of what? What do you think they told me? They were homeless because they were black. They may have been homeless because they were given a bad deal. They were homeless because of the drug problem. Now, I'm not telling you that them being homeless did not have something to do with all of those things. I'm not going to tell you that some of them, they may have lost their home, lost their job. They may have been injured. I got it. But what I found was that hardly any of them told me I'm homeless because I made a decision and then another bad decision and then another bad decision. Because here's the deal, you have to take responsibility, not only for the things that make you successful, but you have to take responsibility for the things that hurt you. As soon as you can take responsibility, then you can overcome it. I want to tell you a story to end with. Napoleon Hill writes about this guy who is one of the founders of a multi-million dollar company. I want you to think of the time when everybody were, had to travel on covered wagons and the gold rush was there. People would go out and spend months and months looking for gold. Well, this guy said, you know what? I'm so tired of just living my everyday. I want to go find gold myself. 
And so what he did was is that he, he sold everything he had and he got on the road and when a week became another week and a month and, a, and so he went out and he, and he actually found gold. So then he secretly marked the spot where the gold was and he made the long journey back home. He went back home and he talked to his neighbors and his friends and his family. He begged them for money so he could buy the appropriate mining equipment so he can mine for this gold. What happened? Well, he went back to the site and nobody got it and he found enough gold to pay off all the equipment, to pay off all his debtors, but then the gold dried up. Well, he kind of patted himself on the back because at least he said, at least I had the journey, at least I did this, and he sold all of his equipment to the junk man and went home. The junk man looked at all the stuff set up. He took a little bit of money he had and he hired an engineer. The engineer went to the site, did a little digging around and found out that the original guy was three feet from gold. You get that? He was three feet from millions and millions of dollars. Needless to say, the junk man became a millionaire. What's the moral of the story? Well, this would happen. I want to ask you a question. If you walked away from millions and millions of dollars, if you realized that all of your stuff was set up and you were three feet from gold, what would you do? In our society, number one, we'd probably try to go back and sue him. We'd probably be in court and be like, hey, that's my money. I want my money and I want it now, right? We try to find a way to do that. Or anytime somebody asks us about our life, we would always tell them, you know what? I was almost a millionaire, man. I had my equipment set up and everything was good. And, you know, but he didn't do either of those things. When he found out that he was three feet from gold, he changed the way he lived his life. He was an insurance salesman. And every time somebody told him no, he looked at that person as being three feet from gold. He pushed that much further, that much harder. And he became a multi-millionaire, and his company became a billion-dollar enterprise. Look up Napoleon Hill's book, and you'll see what I'm talking about. That company is still around today. I want you to look at your life. There are many times that you have given up right before your gold. I will tell you now, if you stick with this, if you stick with some of these techniques, you're going to be successful. Write down your plan, number two. Write down your plan. Write down what you want. So first you have your goals, your dream, and then make a plan to get to your dream. You can do it. The other key is to be specific about your plan. I do this in counseling and coaching all the time. You have to be specific in what you want for your dream and out of your life. And this is what I mean. It's not enough to say, I want a car. You have to say, I want a 1950 Chevy with beige interior. It's not enough to say, I want a house. I want a two-story house that's going to cost me $250,000. Why? Because your brain is wired that way. Your brain is wired to be specific with your goals and your dreams. Now, life is going to happen. You may say that I'm going to get this house in one year or two years, and it may take you four years, but you have to write it down. The first question that I would ask is, why is it that most people don't write down their goals? It's because once you write them down, it makes them real. And once they become real and you don't do it, then you may look like a fool. Dream big. So what did I tell you the first to begin with? Your passion, your purpose. Find it. Find new things. Find out what you're looking for. You can be successful. The second thing. Take responsibility for your actions, whether they were good or bad. Take responsibility. Because if you can do those two things, it will lead to the third thing, and that is power. You will be empowered to be successful. You will be able to change the direction of your life. Christopher Columbus was only a degree off or so, but that landed him in a whole different area of the world. If you can look at where you're going, and change your azimuth, change your direction just a little bit, then those of you that would just go through your lives and be okay, if you're able to change it just a little bit, you're going to be very successful. It is time for you to do that. So as you write down your goals, write down your plans, I want you to rank them. Write down 10 things. Take a moment. Pause this video. Stop your car. Do it now. Do it now. This is the other difference. There's only two times to act. 
right now and too late. If you put things off, if you put things off, you'll never do them. There is never going to be a perfect time for you to get that promotion. There's never going to be a perfect time for you to start your business. If you wait for the perfect plan, it'll never happen. I believe this in my heart of hearts. And there's so much research and different consulting agencies and other speakers have imp implemented the same thing for our clients. I believe that if you have a dream within you, you came to this earth what things it needs to be inside of you to complete it. Let me say it in a different way. If you dream of a dream, you are enough to make it happen. Now, what, that, what does that really mean, though? You are still going to have to work hard. You're still going to have to push yourself. Are you ready? Are you ready to give it to the next factor? You know, Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, then you can do it. If you can dream it, then you can do it. My challenge to you on day one, this day, on the 30-day challenge, is for you to dream it right now. Write down your dreams. Don't write down what's possible. Don't write down what you can do with a lot of money. Write down what your dreams are. Number two, find you a mentor. Find somebody in your life that is doing what you want to do in your life. Find that person that's living that dream. Lastly, and I want you to get this, pull out your phones if you're not already on them. And I want you to text your accountability partner. You're like, what's an accountability partner? Your accountability partner cannot be your husband, your wife, or your significant other. Your accountability partner is somebody that's going to hold you to all of these dreams you came up with. They're going to hold you to the fire. They're not going to let it go. They're not going to let you go. I want you to text somebody right now and say, you are my accountability partner. That person is that person. If you were in a weight room and you had that weight on your chest, you're about to push it off. Oh, that's the person that looked down and you and go one more time, man. One more time. You need to find somebody that you're accountable with. Somebody that you can have real talk with. What's real talk? Real talk means that you have to find people in your life that have mean love. What is mean love? Mean love means that your wellness means more to me than your feelings. So right now, I challenge you to find somebody in your life to have real talk with. My name is Ronald Palmer, and this has been Real Talk. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to find your passion, find your purpose, take responsibility, and find your power so you are empowered to make a change. Let's get it done. Thank you.